Hello, everybody. Um, I think we can start now. Some people said hello. Hello to you as well. Um, right before I start, I just wanted to get a hands up of um, who's developing currently in virtual reality or interested in developing in virtual reality. Ah, that's a lot of hands. I like that. That's great. Um, so I originally wrote this talk um, to give you a very dry and technical understanding of designing games in virtual reality. And I had a number of people, uh, most importantly, um, a game designer called uh, Jenna Fisher standing over there, or sitting over there, sorry, um, did a lot of input and advised me that I should actually look at this in a more um, esoteric way. So talk about why, for example, we develop a game that players found meaningful and why they engage with it in a way that was quite positive um, and impactful to us as developers. Why this game, for example, allowed me as a game designer to go walk through the halls of um, the Johnson Space Center at NASA and engage with um, a range of personnel. And that wasn't something that was specific just to the, to the idea that it was, it was set in space. It's something that any of you developing in virtual reality or games in general, I think, um, can apply in a way to, to create authenticity and, and a, a sincerity of subject matter. So let's begin. Okay. So my name is Amy Dennis. Um, I've been working on Earthlight and Genesis, another VR game that we're working on, and a number of other projects that I've paid for the last three years. Um, I've worked as a 2D artist, a 3D artist, uh, a senior material editor, um, a media communications lead, um, and, and a game designer. I'm currently the lead game designer and a project lead of Earthlight. So I've been across this project for the last two years, and it's very close to my heart. Um, and it's, it is very special to me. So what is Earthlight? And some of you may have heard of Earthlight before, and some of you are hearing about it for the first time. It's essentially the, the journey of putting a player into it's the shoes of an astronaut and putting them up into space and the neutral buoyancy laboratory and other situations that astronauts regularly find themselves in. And it's set in virtual reality. So, originally when we made this game, we didn't think that it would have the results that it did. And there's some key factors that I want to discuss uh, with you today in regards to why that is. So this is a shot from Earthlight. And I think that this screenshot actually captures the essence of what I want to talk about today. It is the blue marble, and it's set inside Unreal Engine 4. And this is something that a player can experience. And why is that important? So let's begin by talking about human spaceflight. Only a very select number of people out of billions of billions of people that have walked the Earth have been able to go to space. It's like yeah, 536 people have been up there so far. But interestingly, even though we've been sending people up there since April 1961, uh, we've been watching the stars for quite a long time. So from Mesopotamian temples, or temples uh, that were on the River Nile, human beings have been stargazing for a very long time. It's a very universal, a very global, and very connected part of our species to stare up at the skies and wonder what we're doing here. How do we get up there? You know, is the Earth flat? So, the International Space Station is the environment, for example, that a part of Earthlight is set in. And it's a fascinating construct, right? It's 450 tonnes of metal travelling at mind-boggling speeds, and it will um, span the size of a football field, right? And it's this thing that has been up there for a very long time, since 1998. And hopefully it'll be up there for a little bit longer. See, this is a, a key point I want to make is that NASA always advises us that the ISS may suddenly not be up there and all the this, you know, subject matter be, may become uh, relevant. So this is the ISS. This is our subject matter for, for, um, for Earthlight. And this is the ISS in Earthlight, right? This is an environment that a player gets to experience. And again, we're going to discuss why this is important to us as game designers or game developers. The ISS will fly over us five times during, uh, during GCAP today. It does a full rotate orbit of the, of the Earth every 90 minutes. Um, this isn't science fiction, right? This is science fact. And like VR, it's something that we previously thought was the figment of our imaginations, and now it's a reality. But what is VR? So virtual reality essentially started off as you know, science fiction, basically. And then it became a simulation and training aid. So it was ingrained into parts of our society that we're not commonly exposed to, which is an interesting thing. Um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Then it became something weird. Um, 
But essentially, it's the virtual reality is a convergence of physical interaction and digital experience design. So in principle, it's the idea of placing a physical human being into a digital avatar and imposing them into a digital environment that we construct. In principle, it's that. And anecdotally, I just want to add that, for example, when we do press um, engagements and we talk to the media, this question always comes up. You know, what, do you think VR can do more than games? Games is the last stop in virtual reality. They've been using VR since the 1960s to do a host of things. We're the last, last people on the line here. So it's our lenses that are the fresh ones now. We're looking at VR in a way, as game developers, that's quite new because it's going straight to the consumer. It's not just $300,000 kits hidden away at um, some NASA lab somewhere or some military, military uh, simulation center. We're now able to deliver VR experiences for the first time in a way that can be mass consumable. But it can be a lot more than that. So the talk that I, uh, I'm giving today is actually not specific to just Earthlight. It can be specific to any subject matter uh, that you're working on right now, but it's this idea of discovering why and how and how you can make this impactful to the player. So why did we use virtual reality for Earthlight? And this is a good question, it comes up all the time. Like, why did we go with VR? We could have made it in mouse and keyboard and a monitor. We could have put it on a console or something like that. You know, it's just a, a, an astronaut experience, whatever. And there's a very kind of sincere and truthful and honest explanation to this, why it was set in VR originally. Because VR was taking off and everyone was going crazy for VR. So Earthlight was originally a tech demo. And Earthlight, when it was first created, was originally made so that we can actually just sell some plug-in stuff that we're, we're working on during GDC. And that's where the idea of motion map controllers came in. So originally, during this technology demo, we actually used motion map controllers to map a player's hands onto that of an astronaut body because we were selling a plug-in that was uh, called the Connect for Unreal. And we're essentially creating a showcase for that. We didn't realize at the time that we kind of stumbled onto something that was quite interesting. We, were just, we just thought it'd be cool to put people up in space, basically. So this technology demo actually got a huge amount of interest and press and public um, engagement as well. And that was quite interesting, because at the time, we didn't really get it. Anecdotally, like a story that I tell everybody is that it was so fascinating to watch people try this Connect and Oculus demo of Earthlight where your hands are freely able to move around, um, around the environment at, at any speed you like, and they would slow their movement down. So the more immersed they became, the more their movements became considered, and they kind of had this weird flow. Um, and you can almost match that to the way that astronauts move in, in the kind of YouTube live feed, uh, feeds that you get. And that was fascinating, and we didn't know why that was um, the case at the time. Right, so I'm gonna click that. Right, so Earthlight became a tech demo and then just exploded. So we had a product in our hands. We thought, all right, cool, we're, we're onto something. But I don't think we actually quite knew why it was significant. I mean, NASA reached out to us and said, you guys want to come do a tour of our offices or, and, and our centers and facilities? Do you want to take um, research material, speak to astronauts? Like, yeah, sure, why not? But I don't think that until <laughs> recently. Yeah, see, the story with that is that they actually messaged me on Reddit. So it was a really kind of casual exchange. We just, you know, talking to NASA today. Um, <laughs> but why? So why was it disengaging? And this is the meat of, of, of why Earthlight, I think, um, is a good example of some interesting design points that we can discuss today. So the first thing is essentially looking at the idea of agency. And the next one is affordance and authenticity. So these three things are what I'm going to discuss today. And at the end of, or near the end of the talk, we're going to kind of do like an audience exercise and it'll be great. Uh, or really awkward, one or the other. <laughs> what is agency? So agency is the idea of making a player feel like they exist within this world. They have two hands, we have their head in the game, the direction they look is mapped into their digital avatar, they control their own camera by their head movements or neck movements, and where they place their hands is where the avatar's hands are. And I think this is a level of essentially immersion that we haven't had before. And it's scary. But essentially, we've got a body in the game, and we can put your hands into the game. 
but how do we tell that you have a body? How do we tell that you exist in the game? How do we give you meaningful interactions? Question. So how do we act and how do we move? And these are, this is going to come back around again. So this is part of the core loops. The player exists in VR because of agency. But now what can the player do? And this is an interesting question. And this is one that um, Jesse Shell from Shell Games has covered a lot. So affordances is the ability to essentially have freedom in your environment. So for a player to engage with that environment and, and overcome solutions and um, Oh, sorry, challenges and create their own solutions and find ways to circumvent obstacles. So this was an interesting part of VR and Jesse Schell actually, for example, in his VR talk at GDC mentioned that this is the, one of the key drivers of how to make engaging VR experiences. So we give the player the two hands and we give them infinite approaches and we give them multiple solutions to puzzles. So we've got our agency and our affordances and they have a body in the game they have the freedom to, to exist in this game as well to do things. But that could apply to any game. And it could apply to any platform. We need authenticity, essentially. We need to be authentic to the subject matter. So authenticity is this really, really interesting trap, right? Because it can either mean that you're making something that is sincere or you're making something for the sake of realism. And these two things are really important points for you to consider because one of them burnt us really badly. Again, we talked about how space exploration is this human kind of our universal trait. Everyone, for example, has gazed upon the stars, whether it's romantically or you're an astronomer or you, know, you believe that your horoscope means something. Um, we're all connected under this one thing. So this is this really, really kind of a romanticized concept and it's a part of us as a species. But how do we capture that as a game designer? So this is where authenticity comes in. And this can apply to not just space. It can apply to you know, um, copying gun cutter from Equilibrium or copying some, some, some movie that you've seen that pings well with audiences and transporting that into an interactive experience in virtual reality. And it has a different point. Authenticity also translates to what we can give back to the player, especially in virtual reality now. We have the ability to teach skills and pro provide accessibility to environments, both imagined and real, that are in inaccessible to players in a way that we haven't had before. So we have an onus on us as VR developers to take advantage of that. So it's not about just making shooting galleries and ma making trivial exercises and, and things that people um, essentially bounce off from after five minutes of play. It's about thinking critically about what we can give back to the players. And how do we engage them past this first, like the menu? How do we engage them past the first five minutes? Earthlight, for example, could have just been a game where the player only just feels like an astronaut and walks away from that, and they think, yeah, that was cool, I was up in space for a little bit. But it was more than that, and we didn't realize it at the time. And we only learned that recently. So the demo that we showed off was uh, in PAX West, was set in a neutral buoyancy laboratory. And we took it there with a lot of QA, and Previously, our mission statement for, for making this game was that we would really, really make it authentic. And what that meant to us, that let's make it really, 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 really ridiculously real. Everything's got to be as real as it is. So the movement mechanics have to be as real as we can make it to what it feels as to be an astronaut. The way that you, you move your head um, inside of the helmet, for example, has to be confined into that helmet the way that you can bump into things, the way that things react to you. Everything, just let's make it really real. And we didn't, we didn't really know why. I think we just chased after that in a way that was kind of like, if it's authentic, it ought to be good. So ridiculously real. <laughs> and the feedback that we got was really interesting, right? <laughs> <laughs> And like, the first test results were less than positive. And as a game designer, that's really confronting feedback because it's not very constructive. Why do you fucking hate this game? Tell me. Oh, I hate that I can't look around the environment. I hate that I can't move around freely. Your movement mechanic makes me feel sick. Um, I hate you. I hate this game. I hate being here. <laughs> so it continued. Um, <laughs> everyone hated it. Right, and we were panicking. This is us in the panic mode. Um, 
<laughs> so there's a lot of screaming, crying, internally crying, sobbing. Um, and obviously we're in the same room with as people, so you have this really brave face and you go, oh yeah, cool, like, I'm sorry, I guess. Um, and during the panic of that, there was a sentence that was uttered that changed everything, right? It's that whilst I was panicking and, 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 um, and trying to explain away why this game had made this person feel sick, I said, astronauts do this for six hours uh, and they feel sick too, it's okay. And that changed everything. The same person turned around and asked me if we could make it harder and if we could make it more realistic. Like, what? What are you talking about? You just said that you hate me in this game and, and you feel sick and you don't want to be in this game anymore. Then he turned around and said, oh, no, if astronauts do it for six hours, like, maybe I can do it too. Can you make it so that I, I have to tether myself to each thing? I've done rock climbing before. I think I can do that too. Well, suddenly there was this idea that there, there was a challenge. There was an achievement that this person wanted to overcome and a goal that they set for themselves. They felt connected to the subject matter because we had finally communicated in a moment of panic that there was a connection there. So, <laughs> at the time, didn't know what the hell was going on, right? And this is the statement that stuck with me because the person said this as they were walking out of the room um, in Pax West. And, they said, they turned around and said, can you make it last six hours? And I thought, like, you've been there for 20 minutes, you're sweating, you're exhausted, you look like you're about to faint, why do you want this game to last for six hours? And I, I realised that there was someone who almost finished a demo and they're asking for it to be harder after we told them what astronauts go through. They got their agency, they figured out their affordances and they wanted that authenticity. They wanted to feel connected. And they wanted us to give them the options to set their own challenges so that they can turn around and say, hey, I too can do the NBL training for six hours. I share something with an astronaut. So when I look up in the sky and I see the ISS go past, I can say, I've done a, a, a hundredth of that. I could have been up there too. <laughs> and that's the thing. Like, only 536 people have been to space so far. And I think that... To us, like the biggest thing about being authentic to our subject matter is that we're able to provide accessibility to a space that none of us, probably in this room, unless there's any astronauts here, and that's happened before, by the way, so that's pretty embarrassing, um, <laughs> can feel as that they can partake, that they can, they can overcome a challenge that they can now share with that select 536 people. And that's something that can apply to any subject matter. So a person can feel connected to a movie character. They can feel connected to a piece of documentary, a piece of history. And they can feel as though they've experienced something that now allows them to have a level of empathy and a connection to that subject matter. So it's really important to stress that this isn't just something specific to a space game. It's something that's specific to an authentic delivery of subject matter. Okay. So, how do we do that, right? How did we get to that point? How did we get to the point where I'm panicking and I'm screaming and I just had to do this one key phrase and, and, and make it all go away? And there's a lot of game design that went into Earth Light, for example, because as I said earlier, VR game design is a new thing. There's people that have been working in it for a while, I understand that, but we're all discovering things a lot because we're all using teleportation to move around still, so there's obviously some, some work to do there. So with Earth Light, we take subject matter we derive mechanics out of it, so we have our agency, oh, we have our authenticity, and we have our mechanics, our, our affordances. We deliver that to the player, right? So we have this idea of agency, and then we make sure it's positive as game designers, because that's kind of what we have to do. It's important to note, for example, that we made the mistake of trying to set out Earthlight to be fun. And what we didn't do was to try and make it a positive experience. So as some of you might know, setting fun as a metric is like, the biggest no-no of game design, and we did that, so that was great. Um, but we wanted to, now we understand that it is about having an authentic experience that's positive. And that can mean it's challenging, it's tiring, or it's seen as a very difficult experience, but a user will walk away and feel positive about it. Okay, so what are the core loops of, uh, of Earthlight? The first loop, so this is about agency, applies to a lot of VR games, universally. You move and you interact with things. So you teleport or you move and grab or you use your thumb pad to move around the environment and you interact with things. You pick things up, you bump things, you throw things through a window, you smash them and all the usual VR stuff, right? 
Next one we have is how we deliver affordances. So we have tasks in Earthlight, and it's going to apply to your game too. We have tasks, and we have attempts of tasks as resolutions when we have um, assignments of tasks, and these allow a player to set challenges and achievements and goals that they can overcome. And to each of these things, we have a host of ways that we can essentially establish authenticity. We have feedback mechanics. We have the delivery of art assets, audio, narrative, even UI, diegetic UI. And these are ways that we can make sure that, that, that we have this primary, secondary, and tertiary gameplay loops that hit agency affordances and authenticity. So I saw a lot of people taking, do you want me to go back to that or no? Okay. So the design pillars of Earthlight. Okay. And this is the reason I'm prepping you for this is because we're going to do an exercise soon. And that's going to mean that I'm going to point at people and ask you for your feedback because we're all game developers, so we all have opinions. Um, the first thing was about human connection. So we wanted a player to feel as though that they were not just connected to the game world, but to the NPCs. So we ask that question with everything we look at in the game and say, how does this impact the player's relationship with the world? It can be something as simple as having a handlebar. You know, this yellow handlebar and ISS. How does that impact the player's relationship with the world? How does it impact their relationship with NPCs? And those are really interesting questions because they often don't have easy answers. The iceberg narrative, for example. This is an interesting concept because I think the Martian, for example, does this really, really well. The idea that you get this huge bulk of information that's grounded in science and grounded in research, and then you condense it to a pinpoint and deliver it to the player in something that can be as simple as just one sentence in narrative. Or it can be as simple as just a single art asset, but it's authentic. And the player feels as though that once they've received that information, that they're walking away with that. So the Martian example is, for example, um, is uh, you know, when he blows himself up and he talks about how he didn't account for the oxygen um, when he was setting up his, his uh, greenhouse. And the, the audience immediately feels as though that, hey, you know, that's a bit of information that I know today that I didn't know yesterday. And that's done because they condense it down into this one pinpoint. And the last one is obviously gameplay experience. And some of you, I know, hate the term gameplay, but you know, I'm using it here because I'm annoying. Um, engaging experience, essentially, that aims to facilitate um, something positive for the player. So we're going to do a practice design run together, and we're going to watch a little clip. And this was taken when we were at, um, at the NBL facility earlier this year. Um, it's essentially, we're going to look at the clip and the video. And I'm going to turn the audio on as well, so I hope it's not too loud. And we're going to discuss some game mechanics out of that. So I'm going to select something out of that. I'm going to ask you to essentially think about some design questions here. OK, let's do this. So I'm going to try and make sure this doesn't do something wrong. OK. Is that Captain, good news? So uh, now you can get your PGTs, and settings are alpha 3, clockwise 2. Happy. Alpha 3, clockwise alpha 2. Three. Clockwise 2. And do we need to drive at the same time as well? That's affirmed. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. I'm uh, ready as well. You're expecting six to 14 turns. You're going to turn to torque, and uh, you have a go to drive simultaneously. Okay, talk driving in three, okay. two, one, go. One, two, one. Okay, I'm torqued out after two turns here. Yeah, I got two turns, good torque, green light. Copy that. Okay, you're going to translate over to your uh, your next cinch. Uh, for talk, that'll be H15. Okay. For Kate, that'll be H16. Ah, oh, whoops. Copy, good news. Okay, that's good. All right. So we saw some really, really, really interesting things there and a host of information that's condensed down to about one and a half minutes of video and what I want to talk to you as game developers and designers is the pistol grip tool okay so the PGT and you saw the PGT there um, 
Kate Rubens was uh, EV1, the astronaut who was um, who we just saw there, was using it um, on top of one of the trusses to essentially help compress a radiator on top of the International Space Station inside the pool. So what we're going to discuss essentially is about why this drill can be important for the game, why it's critical, what are some ways that we can approach this drill to make sure that it, it helps the player's agency, affordances, and their ability to experience an authentic environment or game world. So the first one is obviously going to be, you know, how can we um, augment the player's agency from having a drill in the game? It's just a tool, you know, it's this drill, it goes zing, 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 we all know what a drill is. But why is it important? How can we suggest a deep, um, essentially narrative? And how, how do we do world construction from just having this uh, PGT in the game? And how can we, how, how can this improve the player's affordances in the game? How can it improve their game experience? What can it do for the player? What can it give to the player, for example? So, first question I'm going to ask, essentially, with the PGT, can anyone tell me some feedback mechanisms? So what are some ways, yeah, we've got, wait, you, you work for me, you can't put your hand up. <laughs> yes. Great, haptic feedback. Really, really good one. Okay, anything else? Visual. visual? Who said visual? Not yeah. Great. Okay. Audio. Audio, great. Yeah, the Audio design's good. Where's Sally? Yeah. yeah, that's it. So she's an amazing audio designer. Um, I'm glad that audio came up. That's good. Um, audio's an interesting one. So let's talk about that for two seconds, right? There's also some sort of communication of game or gameplay, essentially. Did anyone pay attention to what was being said? Yep. So did you feel as though that there's some, some sort of gameplay mechanics that we can, we can pull out of that in what was being said at all? Right. Does anyone want to answer? Yep, OK. There's a little bit of sort of following orders and cooperating. Yeah, exactly. And what else was there? Returning, like talking back to them. Yeah, exactly. Yep, that's good. And like you know, there was a very specific set of instructions, but then what what, what were they doing with the NPC as well, or the other astronaut? Yeah. Okay. So the divers are giving the tools back and forth, right? What else happened? Like, yeah. Metrics for success. Metrics for success. Exactly. So we're off to a good start. Like we've got this little drill that goes zing zing zing, but we've actually just built like this vertical slice of what it's like to be an astronaut. Right. What do you think this will add to the game? And we just started touching on that too. But what does having a drill add to a game? Yeah? Can it affect change your environment or affect your current environment? Maybe? Great. And how, do, how would it do that? Um, you can either unscrew or screw in something. That one specifically? That's great. <laughs> because... No, that's cool. Okay. Uh, did someone, yeah? Like an alternate option for a puzzle to solve. Great. Can you describe a puzzle to me that you, you know you expect would exist in that environment? Like, to fix something that's broken or something like that. Okay. You need to solve how to fix that thing. So okay. Usually drill. Great. Okay. Good. What else can happen? Can, yeah? It also adds an extra thing that you have to carry around with you. Ah, very good. Okay, cool. What else? Yep. You can lose it, yes. <laughs> Management of your tools in space, very important because you're traveling at 27,000 kilometers per hour. If you lose that drill, that's a ballistic weapon. That's gonna hit a Telstra satellite. Yep. Uh, I think it's the player and I use the model to uh, the game right away. Okay, setting playing expectations. Okay, that's a really good one as well. Yep. Opportunity for base building. Yeah, yeah, okay, so thinking outside the box there. For future crafting, base building, connecting parts of the ISS together. It's actually what astronauts do up there. Yep. Sharing the object between other astronauts. Great. Everyone there isn't going to have one. Or receiving it or giving it to, to um, another astronaut and feeling as though you know, you're sharing these, these tools in space. Okay. Can feel the urgency, maybe because something is broken. Right. Really Can anyone think of uh, failure conditions? What do we do with a drill uh, when, we, when we kind of mess up the torque setting? Anyone know? Yeah? Exactly. So what happens if you strip a bolt in space? <laughs> get, a, get at the cutter and 
get a cut, yeah. Get a new ISS, it's fine, we'll just build a new one up there. Okay, okay good, good. So what is a player expecting versus what is real? So we saw the universal pistol grip tool. Can anyone, can anyone maybe give me an idea of what a player might expect from seeing a drill in the game? Yeah? Great, okay, what else? Yeah? Uh, the weight of that tool. The weight of the tool. Great, how do we communicate the weight of the tool? Okay, cool. So we'd have to pra like do a little bit of QA on it, see what we can do. Um, if you have any feedback mechanisms on how you communicate weight of a tool, does any? Yes, yeah. There's a technique where um, there's a control that's assigned where it's got actuators on the control. Okay. Pushing down on your arm mm -hmm. can actually simulate the, the, the weight of an object. Great, okay. So we're already communicating to the player the weight of the PGT. We're communicating to the player that, you know, the, the context of how it's used. Um, what else can we, I mean, we know that a drill, you have a trigger and it, it goes zing zing and you can set the torque obviously so you don't strip something by a new ISS, mum's upset. Um, but with the PGT, I mean, we also heard some interesting things about the settings. Yep. Yeah, ex absolutely, the settings itself. And this is, the, this is the part that leads on to the next question, basically, right? How can we make this matter to the player? Okay, that's true. And that actually exactly leads on to this next point. So we've got this drill, right? It's a tool in the game, it's a drill. It, it doesn't seem that complex. It doesn't seem like it's something that should matter this much to the player. But what are we teaching the player right now? You stuff it up, you're breaking the ISS. You break, that's right. Huge failure condition. Um, there's, there's a connection that we're making though. We're delivering something to the, to the player that they didn't have before, okay? So this is the part, like I would say the drill is important to the player because you're, you're allowing them, them essentially to have these experiences that only an astronaut will have. So only an astronaut knows how, how heavy their PGT is or the, the torque settings and how careful they have to be about stripping um, a part like a bolt on the ISS and the failure conditions associated with, with you know, losing that tool or having that tool bump into something or passing it, the procedures of passing it. When a player goes into the game and they use that drill, it's not just something that goes zing zing and, you know, great, you've done a good job. They've walked away with the idea that they now know how to use the, the pistol grip tool that an astronaut uses. And they understand this concept. And that is something that VR was really, really good for simulations and, and something that we should transport into, into games, essentially. And it can apply to something as simple as, as a shooting gallery. Or it can be... Um, I don't know, like a ninja simulator or something, as long as you're, you understand and you're cognizant of these key things um, about what you can give back to the player when they take their headset off, that they walk away with a range of skills that they didn't have before. And the anecdotal thing of this is that when we were sitting with the JPL um, guys uh, a couple of months ago, we were talking about a mission plan from the Quest airlock to the S S0 truss. And the plan that we drew, for example, matched the plans that they actually have for their EVA walks. And for me, as a game developer, to know exactly where those handlebars are, and you know, this is from the lens of a player even, to know how to get from the airlock to that to, to the top of the S0, and to discuss, you know, which annoying handles are, and you know, one of them a little, a little bit far away, and um, where should I tether along the way, and things like that. That's only something that someone who's been up there would have, and this is really important for us. So, key takeaways, I guess, is value your players. So agency isn't just existing in a game world. Agency is making the player feel like they not only exist, but they matter in the game world as well. So the astronaut that's up in the, the ISS, or the player that's up on the ISS, feels as though that they have a connection to that game world. Empower your player. Give your player freedom. Give them the ability to solve things. Be challenged. Because if you're authentic to your subject matter, then they feel as though that when they overcome these challenges and they accomplish things inside of this, this environment, that they actually have a contribution back to that game or the game imprints itself upon them as well. So the drill, for example, is a great thing. I mean, a player might fail eight or, eight or 10 times, but by the end of it, they'll know how to operate the pistol grip tool. 
And it goes from some being some simple tool in a game to being a part of a skill set that a player has when they walk out of their game as well. The big one is educate your player. So build an environment for them that is sincere to the subject matter so that your player walks away, as, as, I, was, as I was saying before, with the skills or with some new experiences that carries along with them through their day as well. I mean, for me to know where the handlebars on the ISS are is a privilege, but it's one that I think every player deserves as well. So we teach them skills and remember that your game can be more than just, just a novel exercise. You know, the, the quote that was up before was that there was something missing out of, um, out of VR and it could be just this. Yeah, and essentially closing statement of that is that VR doesn't have to be just putting the players into, into a digital world. It can come back with the player when they take the headset off and it can, it can be a part of their skill set. I mean, because of EarthEye, for example, our play testers have a sense of what it's like to move around in microgravity. And they didn't have that before. And they understand, for example, the, the motor skills required to pivot and rotate and translate their body around inside of microgravity or zero gravity. And that is a, a skill set that only 536 people had access to previously. Okay. So questions, basically. Do we have any questions? Because we've kind of come to the end of that. Yeah? It's a very uh, PR question. Um, <laughs> yes, I failed to mention that. We will be at Acme tomorrow at the Game Changer VR Festival, and we will also be at the VR free play area at, uh, at PAX as well. I invite you all to come down and play. If I recognize your face, I'll probably get you to bump the queue. So, yeah. Um, that, those are the two places. Also, we are um, hopefully looking at like timetabling um, some sort of uh, upcoming releases and, and demos and things like that as well. So. Yeah, come down to PAX or Acme tomorrow, it's free. There's, you don't have to buy a ticket for, for Acme. Uh, yeah? Uh, have you had any astronauts play your game to kind of verify the authenticity? Aha, uh -huh. see, we, they've been through, I guess, they've seen a lot of the screenshots and the environments and things like that. Um, and they, like astronaut uh, Tom Marshburn, he um, came and visited us when we were inside the mock-up of the International Space Station at the JSC, kind of saw the screenshots and things like that. Um, he had some interesting comments, like like color changes of things. It's like you know, um, you should make that a little bit less shiny, and that's actually a little bit stained in real life, and things like that. Um, the JPL guys have seen our NBL demo, and the current conversation that we're having is that um, Earthlight might actually contribute back to the training exercises that NASA has now, um, as, and it's a part of our collaboration with NASA that we're working on, and it's a big big part of um, of why we think the game might be quite special because the play. Feedback, for example, might filter its way back into training exercises. So, you know, when you tell me that, hey, Emery, your game is shit, I'll go, all right, I've got to change that. And an astronaut gets happier, and then when they're up in space, they feel as though they're a little bit better trained. Um, any other questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering uh, if you could expand a little bit more on the authenticity piece. I mean, I come from military simulation background. Oh, yeah, cool. Yes, absolutely. I think that that question applies to us, even it, it, like very strongly because of player experience design as well. So, when when you're making something super authentic, it starts to actually chip away at what a player might find to be fun, and we have to know where to put the brakes on it. So we found that um, having options, having a spectrum of authenticity. So. We don't simulate, for example, things like oxygen um, at the moment. We might do it in the future, or a fire in space. Um, but the physics system is actually pretty, pretty solid at the moment. So objects have mass, and the mass has um, a certain velocity if you touch them. And um, we have drag in the water. But we're not simulating stuff like the electrical systems, for example, only because we don't have access to that data. But labels, buttons, the placement of objects, um, there's a panel inside of the Quest Airlock, for example, that we that you know I did a texturing for that was so um, authentic per se that the engineer who actually worked on that asked me where I got the schematics for it, and I'm like no, we just used eight photos from different angles and kind of just nailed that one. But um, we can't. Well, what we found, for example, was that unless we communicated the authenticity appropriately, it was too much, like being constrained um, to just 
the, the, the glass of your, of your cockpit in the EMU for, for players' camera movement, they found that to be really, really kind of um, negative in their experiences. And having to account for the way that you move when you have to translate and rotate with just using your wrists, for example, made people feel sick. But the problem was that astronauts felt sick too when they first go through their dives. Um, that, I think, was a point where we kind of made it too authentic. And trying to communicate that it seems like a seemed like the key component there. So if you're asking for like, you know, what is authentic in the game right now, the movement is, the, the, the way that you look around the environment is, um, the oxygen, I guess, isn't. We had trial, trial like the idea of blacking out in the NBL because if a human being goes upside down in that environment, gravity is still kind of in effect. Um, so, you know, they pass out. Um, but we did have to essentially have a spectrum of authenticity. And we found that communicating that appropriately was, was key. Um, yeah. I hope I kind of like answered that question in a way. Yeah. Uh, following on from that, yep. how do you balance the need for authenticity with the need for limiting audiences? So for example, uh -huh. if you're still a great tool, can I actually use that to kind of open up every panel and take the entire entrance part? Obviously yep. that's the limited gameplay, but that's what I expect from the authenticity. How do you balance it? Right, like how do we stop Exactly. So how do we stop the astronaut from going on a rampage with the pistol grip tool? <laughs> right. And this is what they do. Like in VR, the first thing everyone does is they, they throw shit, right? Like they flip tables, they throw, like they throw stuff around. And that's what happened with um, the pistol grip tool. Like the first time I had it in my hand, I threw it away just to see what would happen. Um, so they tethered it just to like a solid object now. So I, I throw it, it comes back to me. It's great. Um, the way you communicate that I think is, is the challenge of being a game designer. Because the way you navigate past that and you communicate those things is important because it's all smoke screens, right, at some point. It's um, like it, what happens if the player can't locate the bolt on that panel, but they can locate the bolts on the other panels. Like, oh, I can open this one. I can't open that one, but I can't see the bolts, for example. Or they're all stripped. You know, someone came up and they hit it with the torque the, the, the wrong way around. But it applies to everything as well, like um, the local tethers that we, we, we make the player put on, for example. Um, I have never told the players in the NBL demo for, that they, they can't float away. We turned that off, for example. But they still tether themselves to everything because the game told them to, right? Um, and they don't know, for example, that in terms of like that juicing pass, the cables um, that are floating in the water, they always float back to the player, like through this kind of weird physics bubble. And they don't know that. They just think that, you know, by the grace of physics that the cables kind of swing back and they catch them and they feel good about it, like, yeah, and they jam the cable into the panel and lock it up and then use the grip, uh, pistol grip tool to kind of, you know, close everything up. Um, there's a lot of, yeah, like trickery in play uh, behind the scenes. And the key part is actually identifying where those problems are and then finding all the little, I guess, polish and, um, and juicing mechanics to kind of circumvent those things. So it's about making it look real just as much as making it truly authentic as well. Yeah. Um, how does that work with like the authenticity? Well, you don't have UI in real life, yeah. so yeah. Um, it's actually, it's a good question because how, how do you provide um, the right feedback me uh, mechanics, right, with, with, with um, a diegetic UI for an astronaut? See, they have, um, they essentially rely on things like a lot of our audio cues. So someone says, hey, actually, you know, good story about this. So the way that astronauts figure out whether or not they, their, their, um, their gloves are actually leaking because of uh, um, cuts or chips or something like that is because their oxygen actually goes down and they switch to a secondary tank. Um, so that's their way of saying, hey, you know, you're kind of running out of oxygen, you might want to get back because your glove is leaking. Um, there is no UI mechanism for that, right? There's only just this audio thing that can kick in and say, um, hey, you know, Anna, the name of our astronaut, um, your, your glove was damaged, you have to get back. But can that be a mechanic? Can that be, can that be something that's repeatable? Like how annoying could that be if it happens every single time you go out and you're doing a mission? So the Diegetic UI that we're using right now also has something that's interesting. We're prototyping the usage of augmented reality um, at, with, the, with the NASA's kind of um, Z3 suit visors. So we spoke to the advanced suit team and said, would you be open to having a like a HoloLens type unit inside, like on the visor of, of the, hel um, the helmet for the Z3 suit that's going to Mars? And I said, yeah, like we're looking at that as well. Yeah, great, um, maybe we can do that, do that in the NBL and then we can tell you guys how it's like for, for a player to go through that. 
um, then we can all talk about that. So we kind of cheated along that way, but we also have the EMU as well. So the EMU suit is, um, is a way that we essentially have that level of authenticity and difficulty for the player because there is no UI. Like there's no way other than just your wits and your audio cues and things like that, that you understand what you need to do, where you need to go, um, and if you're doing the right thing. Yeah. You touched on uh, the fact that players step over themselves. Yeah. Regardless. Um, do you think it's, it's human nature to do that? Like is it because of the authenticity? Of oh, they're petrified, theory? yeah. Is it, yeah, it's, it, they could, you might, it could be a case that we're not told to step over them. Yeah. Um, we've asked people to, like in the space demo, for example, we've asked people like, you know, hey, you should let go. And they're like, no. <laughs> Why am I not connected to the station? Like, Don't worry about it, just let go. Like, no, I'm not letting go. And, and someone dropped, one of the engineers actually put me into a demo where they didn't tell me when, when they hit play, they dropped me off the ISS, right? And it's a very, very large 4K texture that does not de-res the closer you get to it. And the scale of it in terms of the, the, the game, um, the units is actually accurate. So everything is like one-to-one -one scale. So it was a, not the game I was looking for at the time, but it was a good skydiving simulator. Um, <laughs> I think that if we told them, for example, like, hey, um, untether yourself and drift away or float away, what we can find is that by reflex, they might push back on that. They might say, no, I, I don't want to do that. But then if we give them the right conditions, such as like narrative points, so maybe the station's on fire or something's breaking up, you have to kind of push yourself and go from one part of the station to the other. Um, if they've led up to this entire idea of, of having authentic processes and then they have to make a choice to, to, to break that, that can be a really engaging experience. But the idea is that um, NASA is full of problem solvers, right? Things go wrong. Uh, for example, one astronaut had uh, water leaking in, in, into, into the suit and the water was sticking to their, to their face when they were moving around. So they were suffocating by, by surface retention of water inside of the helmet that they couldn't do anything about. Like, that would be a terrifying game experience, right? It's authentic, but um, asking someone to like, basically do this mechanic where they can't move their head at all, otherwise the water will keep spreading around their face. Like, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things from, from authenticity that you can actually derive really, really cool um, or engaging game experiences from. Uh, yes? <laughs> the shit I have seen, if I could go back, I would burn every Vive and Oculus kit that's in our company. Um, don't develop in VR. No, I'm kidding. Like, <laughs> that, has been, that has been interesting. Like, for example, trying to make a game in an emerging hardware platform that's also got game engines that are, that are trying to support it in a running battle is really difficult. Um, trying to make a game where you're simulating one of the most complex real-world environments in an emerging hardware platform with emerge, like kind of hard, like ever-changing engines, really difficult. Um, trying to do all that with good game design that has no referenceable points prior to that because everyone's doing it for the first time, yeah, like that's really smart of us, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> it was difficult, basically. And yes, I did find it quite difficult. Um, and there was a lot of trial and error. So rolling QA was a huge part of how we, how we were developing a lot of the experiences. And you saw what happened. Like, we developed for a year, we took it to PAX West, and one of the, you know, the, the first user feedback was, your game is shit. So sometimes it happens. But then it's changed around now. So we've, we've made some tweaks, and um, I think it's Mitchell here. He's our QA person for, on the project. And our last round of QA has been all positive, so we, we're on the right. <laughs> He's also the, he was also the game designer that worked on the project with me as well, so. Okay, um, yeah? How do you balance your emphasis on authenticity with maybe other games when there is no real world analog for what you're doing? Yes, but um, it's a good example, right? Like every game, I think, takes something away from a reference piece of media that came before it. And it can be um, a non-attractive non piece of media like uh, a film or a book. It's about finding the authenticity of that subject matter, right? So if you're making an experience that's... Do uh, you have any examples by any way? Uh, well, I was thinking your other game, Genesis, um, is a god game. Yeah. Obviously, that's not something we can do in real life. Gulliver's in Travels. Sorry? Gulliver's, okay. Gulliver's Travels. Like, we've all either read or watched something that, that has this idea of what it's like to be a giant, right? And 
human beings are fascinated by this concept of what it's like to be abnormally huge. Um, and the way that that was prototyped, for example, is I just wanted to know what it felt like for a person to, to lean down, grab a house-shaped object, and then smash it with their hand. And everyone's like, oh my God, this, is, this feels great. So yeah, it's, it's a God game, but it taps into the idea of, um, of non-interactive media like Gulliver's, Gulliver's uh, Travels. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? I think, how are we doing for time? I, I don't even know, really. Ten minutes. All right. Cool. No. Um, <laughs> uh, anyone else? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the future, maybe. Um, yes. Originally, um, Unity did not have PPR, so we couldn't get environments that were um, that were that had a level of fidelity that was high enough at the time for what we wanted to represent. So the way that the sun, for example, um, bounces off the, the panels of, um, of the International Space Station, um, that's all you know, physically uh, rendered, essentially. Like, it's not something that we could have done without PBR. Um, and then Unity 5 came out, so that kind of, that was fun. Um, we definitely are thinking about having dual platform support for, uh, for one of our other projects. So we'd, we'd make the other game in Unity and we'd have un, um, Unreal um, take Earthlight, basically. But um, the, the fidelity of the engine was key for us. That and, and the idea that um, visual scripting for Blueprints was actually pretty, pretty good. And we've had a really close relationship with, uh, with Epic because of our previous project, uh, Virtual Dementia Experience. Uh, so they were really kind of um, at a high level responding to our feedback with, uh, with engine stuff. So we, we were actually finding a lot of stuff in our VR implementation that, um, that I guess a lot of devs really didn't have access to. Uh, we were doing motion map stuff in, in, in um, uh, in Unreal, before there was Oculus Touch and Vive or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? No? Oh, yeah. whoa, yes, sorry. <laughs> Panic. <laughs> Never ending panic. Um, it's a good question, actually. So the next step for Earthlight, I think, will be that uh, we've, we've gotten a, a host of feedback. Um, we're, I'm excited to know what the, the feedback is going to be from our public showings as well. Um, and we'll probably have to enter into another round of essentially pre-production. Um, because we've tapped into something that's, that's really interesting um, and something that I, I really want to go back to and, and explore as a game designer. You know, how can, how can we um, not make it really, really, really ridiculously real for the sake of that? How can we try and capture the authentic points of this? And like this room, for example, came up with a million ways of how to make just a drill in the game really authentic. So going back into pre-production and looking at how we can, how we can make this um, more sincere for the player, I think, is a, is a key component of that. Um, yeah, panic. <laughs> um, yeah, OK. Yeah, uh, in the main menu, and we were looking very briefly at having an um, iPod, like an, the, for the astronaut to be able to just plug in an iPod. Like we already have mechanics, for example, where the game can detect if your if your um, controllers are next to your ears. Um, the audio design for it has been interesting because um, people don't realise how loud the EMU suit actually is. It's constantly pumping air into into the suit, and it, it um, every time you touch something, it kind of uh, vibrates like a drum. Right, so the, the, the music element of it has been quite interesting for us because we're trying to find ways to put music into it in a diegetic sense, but I don't think that we would have it in a, in a non-diegetic sense, except for essentially the main menu, which, um, yeah, it's, it's got a really nice soft, soft kind of thing to it. Yeah. Yep. Uh, how have you found taking on a more designer role rather than that of an artist role? What are the challenges that you've overcome? Um, everything. <laughs> uh, so the question was essentially, going from an artist to a game designer, how was that challenging? It was really challenging. Um, I think that the idea was that I recognised, just like you know how you would kind of teach yourself to draw or paint or something like that, that you really don't have the skills to be a professional game designer until you do a lot of research and do a lot of reading and and um, a lot of training. And thankfully, I had. Um, an education from Swinburne University and they, they did teach me how to be a game designer to an academic sense. And 
Um, yeah, there's a lot of scrambling to try and figure out these things. So uh, people that have worked with me, for example, will, will tell you that my general consensus on things that I come up with is that it's shit until playtesting says it's not. And that was a good way of approaching it. So pl responding to playtesting and not relying on um, what I think I know best was, was instrumental to that. Um, and constantly looking for feedback, constantly looking for, for ways that people can constructively add into the processes that I'm using and the mechanics that I'm implementing and the features that I want in the game as well. And discussing things with the team too, obviously. Yeah. So the overview effect is one of the most profound things astronauts have been yes. able to actually talk about. Of the astronauts that have tried um, Earth life, have any of them reported that it, they've experienced the same thing? Well, that's the thing. I mean, even from the screenshots, Marsh, uh, Tom Marshburn's rest he said, he's like, you know, I, I will come to launch this game. Um, and he explained to us a number of things um, that are critical to that. Like, for example, um, he told us that when the airlock is pressurized, the tools jingle, and there's like this, this, this weird symphony of all these things that are like, you know, jingling around and metal hitting each other. And then once the airlock um, decompresses, that it's just completely silent. And he said that actually was the most confronting thing that he had to put up with, the idea of this just like dead silence of space and just the constant air ventilation sound. And obviously um, the quest airlock opens up and he goes feet down and, um, and out and he sees like the entire human civilization in front of him. And in Earthlight, um, what we have found in terms of like a visual milestone has been that. Like I can, by just observation alone, always tell you exactly when someone looks up when the airlock opens up and they go out of it. Because they always freeze. Like there's always this moment of this like, they kind of just stop and then you'll, also, you'll always get like either swearing or someone's just got sighs. Um, that's always been, I guess, a really kind of, um, a really personal kind of thing for me because I love that moment of watching that happen um, because I know that there, there is a level of authenticity there and that's what we were aiming for. And then having all these experiences allows me to look at that with a better kind of, um, uh, I guess, hindsight and a nostalgia as well. I hope I answered that question, yeah. Uh, one at the back, yeah. Right, so one more question. One more question. You don't have a question, though. <laughs> Did I put you on? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious because, like, it sounds like the process was very much, you know, go out there, um, show off the game, get feedback, rework it, show off the game again, get more feedback. Yep. Is this an infinite loop where you keep on doing it and oh, yeah. the game done, or is there a finite point where you say, that's it? That is actually like an entire talk in itself. And I think that a lot of game designers will agree that there has to be a point where you just go, enough, it's done. It might not be great, but it's done. Um, but the idea is that um, we'd always done rolling QA. And the problem was that a lot of the, the people in our office, for example, who tested the game, they started developing skills and they started really easily navigating that environment. I think that the record is that one of our guys can finish the demo in like three and a half minutes. They just, they speed run it. So you, it's like watching a spider monkey crawl through the International Space Station, it's creepy. Um, and yeah, that's the thing, like, um, it was great. I think it was so valuable to have first time VR users and first time feedback go through it. And yeah, it, it can be an infinite loop, but it's, you know, the role of a producer or a project lead or a game designer to actually say, this is enough now. Um, and to try and steer that towards consistent positive experience as much as possible. And once you get to that point, you're always gonna have someone that's not gonna like the game. But if generally people agree that it's, it's a positive experience, it can be challenging or can be, can be frustrating at times, but if it's generally positive, then you're good. I think that's where you stop. Yeah, cool, I think we're done. Well, yeah, all right. <laughs>